So you're jumping into this miniature wargaming thing. The lifestyle, the narrative, the hobby. And I want to give you a heads up, a way to think about it as you evaluate different systems. You might be playing a system right now like Warhammer 40,000 and you're you're looking about jumping into another system with some friends. Being able to exercise some impulse control, easier said than done. I'm not the best example for that, but also being able to understand and plan out acquisition Where's the game going? What are some of the hobby aspects is important because not only do we want to get the most out of the money that we're investing, we also want to get the most out of the time. We want to really create those war gaming memories, roll some dice, push around some miniatures and blow some stuff up, have a lot of fun from that perspective. Now, broadly speaking, uh, this is my observation. Systems break down into an open system and a closed system. There are advantages and disadvantages to both. And I'm going to name two systems in my collection, two systems that I enjoy, and we'll build that checklist and you can apply that checklist. So an open system, Warhammer 40,000, sci-fi miniature-based game, an open system is one where the rules are constantly changing. They're constantly evolving. We, we see this with edition creep. We're in 8th edition, 2 or 3 years later, ninth edition, 2 or 3 years later, 10th edition, 1 year later, 11th edition. And the miniatures of the system, uh, the factions, the armies, the armadas, they are also expanding. There are always new miniatures being added. Now, the advantage of an open system is you get constant rules updates and constantly refreshed rules. Maybe the rules are play-tested and tight. Maybe they're uh, not so play-tested and a little bit wonky. But you get to try different things, and you get to have a freshness to the rules where, as a gaming group or playing with your friends, it's very dynamic. It's not like, well, the same old missions, the same old missions. You can play custom missions. You can make up your own. But having that support from a gaming company or a product for open rules it, it does have some advantages. Likewise, with the miniatures, it's nice to constantly be getting new units, new miniatures. You are able to really constantly expand your factions. Now, the downside, the downside is being able to keep up with it. And a, a lot depends on the system itself. There's a difference between adding a couple of new units and balancing the game or creating a new faction, releasing stuff versus we're going to constantly release stuff and we're going to tinker with the uh, the metrics in the back and the rules so that right now this unit that you have is super powerful. Well, we've already sold millions of units. We're going to nerf it, make it trash. So now you're going to have to go out and buy this new unit. And then we're going to trash that in a year, go out and buy a new unit or limited releases. Sometimes, depending on the system, it can be very, very hard, very, very challenging um, to keep up with the game. You can quickly become very, very overwhelmed. Mass open system games like Warhammer 40,000, they are a lifestyle game. That is the assumption that you are buying into a system that you are constantly going to be funneling money into. Is that good? Is that bad? I mean, I've had a lot of fun with Warhammer 40K. I continue to have a lot of fun. I have a lot of great friends. But you need to know potentially what you're getting involved with. Now, on the opposite end, so that's an example of an open system that's very, very extreme. And I guess we'll look at a system in the middle. Now we're going to go to the other extreme of a closed system and and a very kind of bookended system. Chain of Command, World War II, historical war gaming. So what you see in a closed system is it's looking to replicate something very, very specific, recreate something very specific. The best example, of course, is historicals. So in Chain of Command, we have a rule set that is looking to capture the narrative of World War II, early, mid, and late war. So the rules are never changing. They've been play-tested. They've evolved. They're solid. It is, on a side note, and I've pushed up Chain of Command videos to my channel here under the Chain of Command playlist, best set of rules that I've ever played in any miniature wargaming system. And that's saying a lot because if you've been following my channel, you know I love Battletech. I, I, I live Battletech. I mean, 40K is fun, but 
we're, who are we kidding? The rules are just all over the place. Battletech, amazing rules. Chain of Command, baby cakes. Amazing, amazing rules. So with a closed system, the rules are set. Here's what you have, and they don't really change. Occasionally, there might be some updates or clarifications or an FAQ, but they're solid. On the miniature side, the factions for the game, they're set. They're closed. Nothing new is really ever added. What we see with Chain of Command World War II, there's only so many tanks that are used. There's a couple of variants. There might be some difference in performance where you swap out uh, a a different main gun or you mount some additional weapons. But uh, essentially, this is your unit. This is your squad. This is your ship. We are recreating something historical. Now, that's not to say you can't add stuff or invent stuff or do kind of um, sci-fi alternate timelines. I mean, homebrew is homebrew. But when you buy into a closed system, once you have your army, you kind of have your army. Once you have your historical setup, you have your historical setup. I love DBA. I haven't added anything to my Romans in like 10 years, something crazy like that. I, I don't need any more Romans. And when I, I think about playing, it's not like, wow, I got to add some more stuff or, oh, I could use uh, another Legion. Like I, I literally have all the stands. I have all the siege weapons, command, everything. There's nothing more to add. So from that perspective, when you jump into a closed system, you slowly get up to speed. But once you have your collection, you have your collection. The nice part about this is you don't have to worry about updates. You can enjoy the system for what it is. And it doesn't consume and occupy the hobby aspect of your life or or the constant chasing, the meta chasing, like, oh, this unit's no longer good. This is good. I have to move here. I have to move there. You build it, you play it, you enjoy it. Now, is it stagnant? You're not getting constant new rules. You're not getting constant units. You're not getting constant mission updates. So you do have to be a little bit more innovative. The nice part about a closed system is the money that you've invested once you're up and playing, if you think about it, looking at Warhammer 40K compared to Chain of Command, Warhammer 40K I'm constantly investing in. Chain of Command, once I've got that up, in terms of here's terrain to play on, um, I mainly play late war Germans just for the tanks. I I love tanks, but I also have Americans and I also have Russians. So this way I could play different armies or I could lend out some armies to some friends and and we can play a big battle. I I really don't have anything more to add to chain of command on, on either of my factions. So the money that I invested, the money that I've spent that that's done, that's locked. I'm good. I've got my two tackle boxes. I've got my terrain. We're set. I can invest further money in other systems. So you tend to be able to have more of a diversity of systems that you can enjoy and play. If you're playing a, closed system versus an open system. Then we have some systems that are kind of in the middle. Um, An example of that would be Pacific Rim Extinction. This is is a new system, so I'm I'm picking this as an example. Uh, Kaiju versus Jaegers. It's a closed system in that here are the releases, here are the miniatures. They are pulling miniatures from the movies, and that's it. So in terms of acquisition, you're going to buy the miniatures that you want to play with first, for whatever reason, the ones that appeal to you, the ones that look cool, the ones that have some good rules. Um, Eventually, as you acquire miniatures over the course of the game, you know, maybe it's adding a piece a month. Maybe you come into a little windfall, you buy two or three pieces, invest a little bit of that windfall always. From that perspective, eventually some point your collection is complete. You have some terrain. You buy some other terrain. You build a gaming table. At some point, like historicals, you will arrive at the point where your collection is complete. This is somewhat in the middle because there are different waves. There are new items being added to the game. There are different terrain sets that you can incorporate and build. But it's not at the pace like Warhammer 40K or Age of Sigmar or some of these other lifestyle open system type games. It's very much at a pace that you can control and is very, very manageable as things are being released.
Now, there's no advantage or disadvantage. It's again, it's a question of based on where you are in the moment of this wargaming hobby and where you're jumping into, if it's brand new or if you're thinking about playing another system, being able to plan and look because the last thing that we want to do is have a system that we're not playing or be overwhelmed with a system and a rule set that we're not getting the most out of or playing a rule set where you're in with the system and then you feel like you hit a wall where you're like, look, I wish there was some more new units or I I wanted to add some stuff to my collection. I I like that hobby aspect. Maybe you jump to another system at that point, or maybe you stick with the system that you have. Getting the most, as always, getting the most out of your miniatures and getting the most out of the time that you spend with your friends playing. 